Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. My name is Frank Clooney. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of World Religions, your host tonight, and I'm very glad to um, see you here in our audience for what will be a very um, important lecture. Uh, this is the Dana McLean Greeley Lecture for Peace and Social Justice. Uh, this is an annual tradition that goes back to a very generous donation we received a number of years back from the Dana McLean Greeley Foundation uh, to support an annual lecture at Harvard Divinity School on issues of peace, social justice, or interreligious dialogue that will reach an audience within the school, within the university, but also be of interest to the wider community. The gift was made in honor of the Reverend Dana McLean Greeley, who has his bachelor's degree from Harvard in 1931 and his bachelor's in sacred theology in 1933. He believed that people of all backgrounds and faiths are deeply connected to one another and should work together for positive social change. Previous speakers in the series include Thomas Hollick from University of Prague, who spoke a number of years back on religion in pre or in Soviet and post-Soviet Eastern Europe. Kieran Martin, founder of ASHA, a organization of medical help and education in the slums of New Delhi. Marshall Gantz from our own Kennedy School, speaking on organizing from below, building community from the realities of life. Ibu Patel, founder of the Interfaith Youth Corps. And last year, Shanta Premwardena, who had been, among other positions, the director for interreligious dialogue and cooperation at the World Council of Churches. There are also Greeley International internships. And so, for instance, this last summer, we sent two students abroad from the center with Greeley money, one to Jerusalem and Jordan to work with the organization known as Seeds of Peace, and another to Haryana in India to work with the Indus world. So we're very grateful to the Greeley Foundation and to the inspiration behind it for the possibility of having these lectures. And we are exceedingly grateful to welcome home one of our own tonight, Atalia Omer, to give a lecture entitled Re Reconfiguring American Jewish Identity Through Solidarity with Palestinians, a Relational Approach to Religious Innovation. So welcome back to Harvard. Atalia received her PhD here in 2008 from the Committee on the Study of Religion. She is now Associate Professor of Religion, Conflict and Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame in the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. She is also a faculty affiliate at the Center for the Study of Religion and Society. Her research interests include the theoretical study of the interrelationship between religion and nationalism, and both of those with peace building, the role of national, religious, and ethnic diasporas in the dynamics of conflict and conflict resolution and as a theory of justice, the role of subaltern narratives in reimagining questions of peace and justice, intragroup dialogue and contestation of citizenship in ethno-religious national contexts, and the symbolic appropriation of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict for other zones of conflict. Her 2013 book that has been very well received, When Peace is Not Enough, How the Israeli Peace Camp Thinks About Religion, Nationalism, and Justice, University of Chicago Press, examines the way that the Israeli Peace Camp addresses interrelationships between religion, ethnicity, and nationality, and how it interprets justice vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian context. The book scrutinizes visions of peace, visions of citizenship, articulated by a wide spectrum of groups ranging from Zionist to non-Zionist, secular to religious orientations, and focuses on the perceptions of marginalized groups within Israeli and Jewish <coughs> contexts. The book also shows, shows how hybrid identities may provide creative resources for peace building, particularly in ethno-religious national conflicts where political agendas are informed by particularist and often purist conceptions of identity. The book was recently very favorably reviewed by Peter Oakes in the Journal of the American Academy of Religion, a very lengthy review that was um, striking because it was so engaged in Professor Omer's thinking and um, engaging and in, in kind of being challenged by and challenging some of the presuppositions, but highlighting this very important um, book for us. Uh, she has also published, um, um, oh, I wanted to give a quote. I, I was thinking of, of how to capture what the book is about. 
And um, the opening section of the preface, I thought, captured something of the personal and scholarly dynamic of this uh, recent book. And Professor Omer begins this way. My late father, a journalist, a poet, and a social critic, lived a short and brave life on the radical margins of Israeli society. I am profoundly indebted to him for his legacy. This book is grounded in my memories of his struggle against religious and political coercion, against the occupation of Palestinian territories, and for social justice and equality. But just as my father was a principal critic of, the, of Israel's ethos, my late grandfather was a very stone of its foundation. Zionist Congress delegate, celebrated veteran of, Brit of Britain's Jewish Brigade during World War II, resistance fighter against the British mandate in Palestine, and the post, first post-Israeli independent treasurer of the municipality of Jerusalem. My earliest memories are of their frequently fierce opposition to one another, unyielding but loyal. I carry this dual legacy with me even today. Out of a deep sense of gratitude and love, I grapple with it across the pages of this book. I could go on referring to other articles that Professor Omer has written and ways that her work crosses the boundary between the theoretical and the practical. I'll just mention her second book, uh, entitled Second Book Project, it's not quite finished yet, Rethinking Home Abroad, Religion and the Reinterpretation of National Boundaries in the Diasporas. This will explore why divergences in conceptions of national identity between homeland and diasporas could facilitate the proliferation of loci of analysis and focus points of peace building efforts which are yet unexplored in both peace studies and specific scholarship regarding the relations of diasporas in conflict. And I think this will pertain to tonight's topic. But I would conclude by saying that um, I myself had the privilege of using her work this past winter. I was teaching in Pune in India, and I was invited by the University of Pune to give some lectures on the state of the study of religion in the West today. And I decided to use some articles, timely articles, from the Journal of the American Academy of Religion and one of the articles that I picked out that worked extremely well with a very diverse group at the University of Pune was Italia Omer's uh, response to the notion and the problem of should the scholar of religion be a critic or a caretaker, working to, from the outside, hands off, looking simply to critically unpack what religion is about, or from the inside also to help people on both sides to think issues through and bring them together. And in that situation in India, where they're struggling also with religious identity and a secular society, where there are many tensions across religious bounds, uh, her piece, the piece responding to it, and the entire discussion about struggling to be an intellectual in a intellectually fraught environment worked so brilliantly, I thought that um, I should definitely invite her here tonight. So I'm very glad that Professor Omer could be with us, and I'd like you now to join me in welcoming her tonight. Thank you so much for this generous introduction, and it's wonderful to be back in the Sperry Room and renovated Sperry Room, no less. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, so I'm, um, as I said, I'm truly honored to be back here. Um, and, um, I begin really where um, Professor Clooney uh, left off, which is um, to tell a little bit about the um, conceptual context of, of my work. So recent trends in the study of religion have fixated on excising a disciplinary past presumed to be animated by the ghosts of liberal theology and the colonial and orientalist legacies. As a result, any explicitly normative interest appears to be transgressive of um, presumed scholarly propriety. So in this article that uh, Professor Clooney mentioned, as well as later in my, uh, my first book, I interrogate and question this presumption, not only on the level of theory and method in the study of religion, but also with the reference to complexities of an actual case, with the kind of normative urgencies, the very specificity the case of the case presents. So the article um, title, Can a Critic Be a Caretaker Too? 
inspired a response from several fellow scholars convinced that a scholar of religion ought to be exclusively a critic or a debunker of ideology, and that any normative interest in religious traditions elicits detrimental normativity. In my response to these criticisms, I pointed out that their commitment to non-normativity and the scholar's role as critic is itself a vigorous normative orientation. This is, of course, no epiphany in itself, and indeed, in some contexts, has come to be a matter of common sense. But we academics tend to generate controversy in places where there ought to be none. Um, what this public de debate clarifies is that while one um, concedes that the scholar of religion has no intrinsic duty to articulate public relevance and explicit normative implications of her or his subject matter, like it or not, the pressing public relevance of the study of religion has moved toward us. As a result, our scholarly colleagues from across the academy find themselves confronted by questions and subject matters they had expected to have been secularized out of existence some time ago. Even realist colleagues in political science find themselves confronted with the supposed comeback of religion. Of course, my response and many of us here is that it never really went away. The questions put to religion scholars is therefore whether we have something intelligent, illuminating, perhaps even constructive to say. This is one of the reasons why I came to embrace the potential cross-fertilization between religious and peace studies. I found efforts to develop conceptual and practical approaches to the study and transformation of conflict and violence to be especially promising points of connections with scholarly investigations of the role of religious identities, practices, and traditions in conflict, violence, and prospects for transforming this in the interest of justice and peace. The concept of strategic peace building refers to a research program developed at the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies, where I work, um, and sub subsumed under the umbrella concept of, st um, um, uh, of this term, strategic peace building offers a multidisciplinary and multidimensional lens analyzing root causes and systemic and cultural forms of violence and their relations to acute forms of violence, sometimes referred to as hot violence and how various levels of vertical and horizontal engagements or peace building activities from a focus on international and humanitarian law to human rights norms, diplomacy, education and implementation mechanism of peace agreements, community organizing are relevant areas of research and practice. This orientation informs some of the discussion in my, in, 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 in my book, When Peace is Not Enough, which focused on hybrid identities in Israel and the kinds of counter-hegemonic critique they can embody um, and leave out, as well as the resources available for reframing the broader question of identity and therefore the possibility of the negotiability uh, of entitlements and grievances at the root of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. A major point of departure for that project is the recognition that how people narrate their identity and history is integral to how they understand conflicts, how those conflicts might be assessed, and what resources become accessible for either escalating those conflicts or transforming them with uh, an understanding that conflict doesn't go away. Uh, religion intersects strongly with cultural, social, historical, and political claims and formations, and therefore the study of such intersections, from my perspective, become a relevant point of convergence between the study of religion and the practice of peace building. Now I turn to a focus on the bidirectional impact of Palestinian solidarity on refiguring Jewish meanings, identities, texts, rituals, and so forth. By bidirectionality, I mean that tracing how American Jewish Palestine solidarity activists reinterpret the Jewish tradition illuminates the relational, multi-perspectival, social, and historical dimensions informing processes of religious innovation and change. Here, critique is motivated by outrage that leads to solidarity with the predicament of the other, and caretaking by an expensive understanding and engagement with the internal plurality of Jewish tradition and history. In taking up this question in my current project, I ask how a social movement that views itself as offering a Jewish critique of Israeli policies expands and alters the multiple strands of Jewish tradition 
and what broader implications are there for the study uh, of the connection between religion and social change. Here's what I'm going uh, to do um, uh, today. Uh, based on in-depth semi-structured interviews with 30 Jewish Palestine solidarity activists and 70 more non-Jewish actors of diverse de uh, denominational or non-denominational backgrounds and geographic locations and systematic study of Jewish solidarity movement, social media, and its, um, and its overlaps and differences in relation to the broader Palestine solidarity movement, I will first identify uh, the patterns that I see uh, and illuminate the resources that Jewish Palestine activists use in, the, in this bi-directional dynamic of critical caretaking. This bi-directional dynamic, to restate, refers both to the ethical thrust toward the case in question, but also how the outward directed ethical engagement feeds back into and results in innovation with the identity and constitutive elements of the tradition. So that what we see here is religious innovation and not dissolution. This is not ethical activism dressed up in, uh, in the remnants of Jewish trappings. Secondly, I turn to the task of discussing the limitations of their stated concern and effort to work toward peace in the Middle East. This research um, is in progress, um, but at this juncture, I'm able to gesture uh, toward general patterns. Um, uh, so in what follows, I'm going to offer some specific examples, but we'll be happy to, um, to go into further detail uh, during the Q&A uh, session. So I'll start with the mapping. And have a sip of water. <laughs> So, indeed, a growing number of American Jews, as evident from the upcoming Open Hillel event at Harvard uh, this month or next month, uh, participate in the Jewish critique of Israeli policies and Palestine solidarity activism of various sorts, from occasional protests and attending relevant talks to active organizing and intersections with broader Palestine solidarity activism, such as the boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaigns. I begin by situating the Jewish Palestine solidarity activists within the broader landscape of American Jews. All right. So uh, what does it mean to be Jewish was one of the key questions animating the recent Pew survey studying changes in Jewish American identity. The findings are illustrative. 73% identified remembering the Holocaust as an essential part of what being Jewish means to them. Uh, in a potentially related manner, 69% indicated that leading ethical, moral life constituted an essential aspect of being Jewish, with 56% highlighting working for justice, equality as the key meaning. Caring about Israel comes at the fourth place with 43%, after the 49% who are indicated that being intellectually curious was the essential part of what being Jewish meant for them. Other responses included having good sense of humor, 42%, being part of Jewish community, observing Jewish law, 19%, um, and eating traditional Jewish foods, 14%. While remembering the Holocaust could correlate positively with the sense that Israel is essential to one's Jewish identity, including the accompanying support of Israeli policies, for many of the American Jews I interviewed, it was precisely remembering the Holocaust and a commitment to ethical and moral life, as well as actual social work for justice and equality that both informed their moral outrage and critique of Israel, as well as their solidarity work on behalf of Palestinians, pa Palestinian rights and qu uh, quest for dignity. Their interpretation of the Holocaust is very much consistent with the broader American interpretation of this event as at once unique and universal, and one that ought to, res to result in action focused on human security. The outrage my, interview my interviewees expressed is anchored by a profound sense of Jewish history as it relates to social action, namely a commitment to the underdog, which is often the term um, that they use themselves, uh, along with words such as oppress or victim, or in Hebrew they would use the word ashukim. So outrage and critique. The South African-born rabbi Brian Waltz publicly discussed testimony is illustrative of the process of outrage, de-learning, and a turn to Palestine solidarity. His relation to Zionism transformed radically in 2008 upon uh, visits to, the, to sites the, of demolished Palestinian homes as part of his involvement with the work of rabbis for human rights 
and the Israeli Committee Against Home Demolition. This visit shook him to his core by his own te testimony. He, he, he writes, I remember standing on the site of a recently demolished Palestinian home, seeing the children's toys lying in the, in the rubble. Uh, this site prompted him to question, what does it mean for me to, be, to believe in a Jewish state that demolished Palestinian homes using bulldozers to destroy everything, including the toys of children, while it builds and subsidizes thousands of homes for Jews? How can I understand this reality as a Jew? Is this the Jewish state I believe in? and support, as a, as a supporter of Israel, as Zionist, am I implicated in this evil act? What is the appropriate response? Walt's outrage about Zionist practices and Zionism as an ideological construct resonates with what the Jewish actors I interviewed described as their process of disengaging from Israel by way of experiencing a moral outrage deeply rooted in their identity as Jews. So, for instance, a woman in her 20s tell her process of awakening by way of outrage and dissonance. Uh, she told me, I grew up in a Zionist family uh, in North Carolina rally, and I attended Jewish day camp, Jewish summer camps, and on a yearly basis, when I visited Israel, I experienced a sense of dissonance. I started asking questions. I went by myself to the West Bank and East Jerusalem. I was shocked by the separation wall. A real sense of dissonance. This set me on the path of learning more, so it was not exactly a sudden conversion, but I started educating myself and began a study abroad program in Tel Aviv. During this period, I went to Bethlehem for spring break and got a crash course on the Palestinian perspective. I experienced a major transformation of views. I found no common ground with the other Jews on the study abroad program. I saw the play, My Name is Rachel Corey, that documents the story of the American activist who stood in front of a bulldozer and was crushed to death trying to uh, protest the demolition of a Palestinian home. And I was profoundly moved by it. I identified with her rather than with the Israelis, and I realized that I was on the side of Western activists. And so I gave up my Zionist identity. Variations on this story recur in all the interviews with Jewish activists that, that I conducted. All right, so the sense of outrage is also directed to the perceived failures and silencing patterns of Jewish leadership outside of Israel. To actually stand in solidarity with Palestinians, Rabbi Brent Rosen, who recently actually had to resign from his leadership position um, of a congregation in Evanston, Illinois, so he writes in his um, wrestling um, in the daylight, um, uh, opposition critique would amount to communal heresy. But he eventually reached this place where he felt ob obliged to challenge Zionist interpretations for Jewish identity and history by retrieving and articulating a different understanding of the Jewish tradition. This is the kind of hermeneutics suggested by the concept of what I've referred to as critical caretaking. Following a long journey of privately questioning the taboos informing American Jewish establishment's positions on Israel and Israeli policies, Rabbi Rosen went public with a blog post on his blog, Shalom Rav, at the early stages of Operation Kasled in Gaza, so that's 2008-9, titled Outrage in Gaza, No More Apologies. The blog post opens with outrage. The news today out of Israel and Gaza makes me just sick to my stomach. I don't buy the rationalizations anymore. I'm so tired of the apolo ap apologetics. How on earth will squeezing the life out of Gaza, not to mention bombing the living hell out of it, ensure the safety of Israeli citizens? Rosen ends this initial post with a penetrating question. There, I've said it, now what do I do? Part of the reason why the question about action with which he closed his initial coming out of the liberal Zionist closet blog's post has been difficult is because Rosen realizes that he speaks against Jewish mainstream's con convention, but that he has to speak up because he's a Jew and one holding a leadership position within the community. The outrage that his experience is directed toward what Israel is doing in the name of Jews to the Palestinians of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. The outrage is also aimed at the landscape of silencing intercommunal and broader debate about the blind support of Israeli policies. This is the kind of silencing that rendered any critique of Israeli policies as either anti-Semitic or self-hating and posits an unconditional love of Israel as a foundation stone of Jewish communal life. Accordingly, the narrowing of the space of critique means that Jews who are ethically outraged still ch uh, chose silence and thus complicity. 
Judith Butler, the renowned feminist theorist who has participated in the counter-Jewish discourse, points out a profound irony, quote, the current Jewish critique of Israel is often portrayed as insensitive to Jewish suffering, past as well as present, yet its ethic is based on the experience of suffering in order that suffering might stop, end of quote. Uh, Butler, as well as the other Jewish critics, do not turn their back, backs to their Jewishness, but rather criticize Israel as she stresses, in the name of one's Jewishness, in the name of justice, precisely because such criticisms seem best for the, for the Jews. But this form of Jewish critique is deeply embedded within a multi-perspectival and relational conceptualization of the justice discourse. Continuing the conversation in the midst of caste-led operation, Rosen struggles with the morality of Israeli actions, Thank you for sharing your very honest outrage and grief, Elaine writes to Rosen in response to a subsequent blog post, illuminating once again the desire to respond in a Jewish fashion, drawing on custom, she continues. If it is the traditional Jewish custom to tear one's garments upon hearing of a death, then perhaps this can be also be understood as a call to tear down the pretenses by which we rationalize the violence that leads to those deaths. Lynn, another co commenter, agrees with Elaine. We, we should see Shiva mourning the, uh, uh, the ritual Jewish mourning of the death of innocent Palestinians, the death of innocent Israelis, the death of, for some of a dream of an Israel that is a light unto the nations. Lisa Kay echoes the general tenor of Jews felt silence and struggling with an increasing, increasing sense of dissonance between their understanding of Jewish values and meanings and the actions of the Israeli nation state. They were socialized to support no matter what. I just wanted to thank you from the bottom of my heart for truly being a Jewish leader and speaking out when the establishment has such strong forces to silence us. You provide me with the invaluable spiritual reassurance that my moral compass is on track, end of quote. It is also the case that even if most of my Jewish interviewees expressed a sense of estrangement, from their families, or at least civility and an agreement not to discuss the complex issues of Israel, they find a community in, in one another. And within this context, uh, and within, within the context of their Jewish activism for Palest Palestinian rights, some express a deepening of their Jewish identity and practice as a result of their activism. Fast forward from cast led to the very recent days of Operation Protective Edge, and with the same mode of critique, leading voices of Jewish descent illuminated the tragic connotations of marking 9th of Av, which fell on August 4th and, and 5th this year in the midst of the destruction of Gaza. Rabbi Michael Lerner wrote an article for Salon.com that reached a wide network of readers on social media and beyond, titled, Mourning for Judaism Being Murdered by Israel. The article stresses that the distortion of Judaism is profound. Quote, the worship of power is precisely what Judaism came into being to challenge. We were slaves, the powerless, and, and though the Torah talks of God using a strong arm to redeem the Israelites from Egyptian slavery, it simultaneously insists over and over again that when Jews go into their promised land in, in Canaan, now Palestine, they must love the stranger or the other, have only one law for the stranger and for the native born, and warns do not oppress the stranger or the other. Remember, Torah reminds us that you were strangers or the other in the land of Egypt, and you know the heart of the stranger. It is forgetting and subverting these motifs that Lerner was mourning on the 9th of Av in the midst of Operation Protective Edge. Rabbi Lerner's rereading on the 9th of Av through the ethical urgency of the present is a common strategy of Jewish Palestine solidarity activism's conscious effort to reinterpret Jewish meanings textually and liturgically. One canter on the Rabbinical Council of Jewish Voice for Peace reflects on the profound challenges posed by the Exodus narrative, Exodus 23, to 20 to 32, of what today, he writes, we could only call ethnic cleansing. The story of expulsion, killing, and displacement, he underscores, comes at the end of the traditional Talmud curriculum, after focusing on the laws for correct conduct elucidated from the Torah portion of Mishpatim, in which the verses from Exodus are also contained, trying to make sense of the bloody passages that stand in such contradiction 
to his contemporary sensibilities, the cantor refers to them as biblical acknowledgments of human nature and the ways of the world. In trying to talk to other Jewish leaders about the reality of life um, of the West Bank, the cantor rekindles what he takes was the rabbi's logic behind downplaying the conquest narratives by excluding the end of Mishpatim out of prayer and liturgical readings while keeping the beginning of Mishpatim within the Talmud in the curriculum, Judaism laid out for us the, a path of constructing our moral universe in an often violent and just world. It is up to us to decide war or peace and justice, he retorts. The Bible includes both. The rabbis of old established a Judaism that chooses peace which will we choose? The picture that emerges from this midrash, featured on a blog called the Palestine Talmud, is of an effort to reclaim the old rabbinic wisdom and intentional suppression of nationalist messianic impulses. The cantor's engagement with the sources of the tradition is deeply grounded in his reading of Zionist practices how they have been authorized biblically and a multi-perspectival approach to questions of justice. The cantor is confronted by the sense of injustice experienced by, uh, by the Canaanite, the Hittites, etc., of the biblical to topography and the indigenous Palestinians of today. <clears throat> Rabbi Lynn Gottlieb, one of the leaders of Jewish Palestine Solidarity, Similar, similarly begins her book, Trail Guide to the Torah of Nonviolence, with quotes from Deuteronomy 31.1 and Babylonian Talmud Sanhedrin 21b. Each generation writes its own Torah. Gottlieb's account traces the, moti the motifs of Jewish nonviolence, as well as confront what Gottlieb articulates as the destructive Jewish behaviors toward pal Palestine and Palestinians. She recognizes the counter arguments concerning Judaism and militarism, especially in a post-Holocaust era, but nonetheless argues for the need to revive and retrieve the principles of nonviolence that had undergirding, undergirded Jewish life and wisdom for most of Jewish histories. She realizes that by challenging militarism, she directly confronts Zionism. She writes, non-cooperation with structural violence is part of the fabric of rabbinic religiosity. One has to choose unequivocally the sword or the book. So placing Shmirat Shalom or the, uh, uh, becoming guardians of the peace at the center of Jewish life is consistent with the with Jewish tradition's call to be a blessing. Well, for many Jewish activists, the reclaiming of their Judaism involves reinterpreting Jewish history and culture as an uncompromising work for the oppressed and for challenging oppressive structures. This commitment is further rooted in the sources of tradition. Explicit allusions to Talmudic passages offer, offers, therefore, a common strategy and pivot around which the rabbinic voices articulated in the Palestinian Talmud blog illuminate um, uh, um, uh, they illuminate the imperative to stand in solidarity with the Palestinians. This thread within the Jewish tradition is juxtaposed to Constantinian Judaism. Once again, this is a term the activists themselves use and interpret as a subversion and perversion of Judaism. Of course, they are not the first Jews to articulate a critique of Zionism firmly grounded in ethical and philosophical impulses. They are situated in, the, in, uh, in this respect within a formidable list of intellectuals from Hannah Arendt to Noam Chomsky to Mark Ellis and the Boyarins, all of whom are aware of the implications of Zionism to its victims. This turn, however, invites two interrelated developments. The first is to theorize Zion out of Jewish identity through the valorization of the diasporic and millennia of Jewish quietism this subversion of the, of the Zionist logic informs and consists with thin secularist imagining of the optimal solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. By th thin secularism, I refer to the activist deployment of abstracted concepts of citizenship as reg regu reg regulative principles, as if attaining such a profound restructuring of geopolitics can come about without a thick social, religious, cultural work. This is as if they, the very realization that Zionism is philosophically and ethically an untenable idea can simply open the way for theorizing the sociological and anthropological complex lived and embodied realities of Zionism out of existence by coming up with a seemingly better idea. 
I will return to this uh, particular point shortly in the section on limitations. Okay, so uh, my focus at the moment is more sociological and points therefore to uh, rabbinic and lay voices that form together a, a social movement critiquing and innovating Jewish meanings, participating in and yet distinct from the broader spheres of Palestine solidarity activism. Rosen, as a religious leader, amplifies the Jewish imperative to stand in solidarity with the underdog. He, he, he says, my primary religious motivation comes from my inherited Jewish tradition in which God commands me to stand with the oppressed and to call out the oppressor. In addition, to this Jewish calling that transcends space and time, Rosen also articulates a commitment to a particular social political settings, uh, therefore reversing a conventional imagining of Israel as the destination and fulfillment of Jewish life. I know, he writes, that the American Jewish community is my spiritual home and that I stand with the Palestinian people in their struggle against oppression. And I know that I fervently desire a just and peaceful future for Israelis and Palestinians. What Rosen attempts, attempts here is distancing Judaism from Israeli policies associated with oppression of Palestinians. And he does so by invoking the already mentioned long Jewish legacy of standing with the underdog. This retrieval of a particular sense of Jewish history as anti-Constantinian was also cited by many of the interviewees, as I mentioned, as a prime motivation to break out of an overly confining conception of Jewish identity. As noted, all of, all of the interviewees re retrieved the historical location of Jews either as the underdogs or as those who should stand in solidarity with the, vict with the victims of various systems of oppression. Hi and highlighting um, a motif of intersectionality, often directly drawn from their participation in feminist and other struggles against military, systemic, and cultural violence. It is consistently re reported to me that this is what Jews have always done, rather than occupy the location of the oppressor. I was 12 during the time of the civil rights movement, um, and the first liturgy I ever wrote was, what can we do for, for, uh, for the movement? This is what a female rabbi activist of, in Jewish Voice for Peace and other organizations recalled in an interview. My reform Judaism, Judaism education, she underscored, was all about what can we do? We stood in solidarity with African Americans. Another activist from, uh, from the San, uh, San Francisco and Bay Area comments that she ended up in the social activism circles to begin with because of her Jewish identity and upbringing in a progressive Jewish community in Santa Fe. Despite a rather conventional Zionist education in the US, her exposure to Israel illuminated for her who she needed to stand in solidarity with. She, she, she told me, once I went to Israel, Palestine, with a perspective about who is really the underdog here, and with a sense that the commitment to the underdogs is so ingrained in my understanding of Judaism, you have to be on the side of the underdog, the minority, the oppressed, she told me. The Jews weren't powerless. The Jews were not the victims here. Interestingly, Jewish Palestine solidarity activists often explicitly use their understanding of themselves as occupying a position of white privilege. Uh, this self-perception offers a further impetus for activism contra Israeli policies and the intersections of Israeli and US militarism and arguments about security and terrorism. Therefore, on the level of analysis of why what Israel does is wrong, they coincide with non-Jewish Palestine solidarity actors who analyze the conflict using categories such as settler colonialism. As Jews, they are outraged to be associated with a political entity that seemingly fits this description. Therefore, they say, not in my name. However, the reversal of the Zionist negation of exile and the presumption that Israel constituted the fulfillment of Jewish destiny invites, by way of solidarity with the Palestinians, a complete disengagement from discussion of the limits of settler colonialism as an explanatory frame in this particular case. The examples uh, above certainly illuminate the sense of outrage undergirding motivations of Jewish actors to participate in Palestine solidarity work. It also illuminates an interesting reversal of Zionist teleology, now New York City, with its diversity and urban cacophony seems more consistent with Jewish values than its Constantinian form embodied in the Israeli state. 
um, strong Jewish roots is something I cherish, another interviewee from the Bay Area told me. I'm more attuned to cultural Zionism, valuing collective culture and wanting to thrive culturally isn't the same as engaging in state power. So when you associate Jewishness with state power, it is destructive. Jewish culture can be stronger by diminishing political hegemony. Look at New York City, Jewish cultures and Jewish plurality flourishes there. Another woman in her mid-20s who is active in interfaith work echoed this. Personally, identifying with the diaspora and not with Israel is very meaningful to me, she said. Many other interviewees, likewise, expressed intense discomfort with what they interpreted as Israeli racism of the kind that, as one of them told me, transported her back to what she had imagined Mississippi was in the 1950s. And most shockingly was her observation that there was no shame attached to ca casual racist pronouncements. Confronted with various expressions of Israeli racism strongly contradicts their sense of Americanness, of being Americans. In fact, it is possible to say that the possibility to filter Zion out of the meanings of being Jewish is parasitical on a sense of being at home in the US and one that doesn't necessarily require theorizing the connections between religion, ethnicity, and the redrawing of geopolitical and cultural boundaries. As indicated, many of the interviewees, when asked about their optimal imaginings, um, uh, imagination of Israel, uh, of Israel and Palestine, uh, refer to some sort of a utopian post-nationalism, -nationalis or at least a liberal nationalism, as they, and they, they would qualify it, like in the US. Um, one not grounded in youth sanguinis, but youth solely principles of citizenship. To this degree, their mode of imagining was basically identical to what non-Jewish Palestine solidarity activists also aspire to, critical caretaking. Indeed, American Jewish Palestine solidarity activists interface with the broader landscape of Palestine solidarity work. This includes identifying, critiquing, and debunking the portrayals of the Israeli conflict in the media, a crucial area of activism born out of the recognition that media representation and, and deconstructing received axioms about the conflict is a crucial dimension of changing the global level of support for Israel, Israeli policies with regard to the Palestinians. The main struggle is, of course, on the level of public relations and branding, and how those modes of branding then confront the, and, and relate to third party uh, own imaginations and operative narratives. The prevailing and interrelated discourses that Palestine solidarity groups uh, of different varieties confront our Orientalism and Zionism and their intersections in the phenomena of Islamophobia. So it, 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 it comes down to, to work at home on, on how, it mani how those issues manifest in Islamophobia. <clears throat> Jewish Palestine solidarity activists occupy a significant role in the broader solidarity movement, also because they assist in deconstructing the discursive terrains that equate anti-Semitism with critiques of Israel, an equation which has contributed to the silencing of debates. Jewish Palestine solidarity activism therefore often function to certify solidarity activism by challenging and the framing of the act of critiquing Israel as anti-Semitic. This mode of certification happens on an intellectual as well as social movement levels. However, beyond certification, which is just a kosher stamp of approval, Deciphering the logic undergirding the struggle over public relations and perceptions of particular modes of Jewish and Israeli narrative illuminates the relevance of critically and hermeneutically engaging such narratives, their historicity, and their relation to power configurations. The focus of Palestine Solidarity Group is fittingly on denaturalizing received knowledge and illuminating and producing alternative narratives that unsettle axiomatic assumptions about the particular issues of, uh, um, the particular issue of Palestine and Israel. To this extent, uh, they, um, um, Jewish Palestine solidarity social or intellectual activists and other Jewish critics are instrumental, not only in critiquing, but also in offering alternative resources for reframing the discourse. They participate in this mode of activism as Jews and with an intention to reimagine the meanings of being Jewish. 
a Jewish um, public intellectual and a supporter of a two-state solution, so not someone who problematized Zionism too profoundly, Peter Beinart offers one prominent example. For centuries, he writes, when Jews lived in the diaspora as a persecuted minority, we had to understand the societies around us because we lacked power, we had to, to be smart to survive. This wisdom is forgotten now, he ex exclaims. Now I fear because Jews enjoy power in Israel and America, especially vis-a-vis -vis Palestinians, we've forgotten the importance of listening. Who, who is wise, asked the Jewish ethical text Pirkei Avot. He who learns from, the, from all people. As Jews, <clears throat> he, uh, he concludes, we owe Israel not merely our devotion, but our wisdom, and we can truly provide it if it's, uh, uh, um, uh, we, we cannot uh, truly provide it if our isolation from Palestinians keep us dumb. Beinart's mode of critiquing the Jewish American establishment, as the above quote shows, also utilizes an interpretive and, or hermeneutical work engaging the depths of the Jewish tradition. His argument about why American and Israeli Jews ought to see and hear Palestinians to combat hatred and racism likewise focuses on how the particularities of Jewish history offers crucial universal lessons about the specific claims and aspirations of Palestinians. By seeing Palestinians, truly seeing them, we glimpse the faded yellowing photographs of ourselves. We are reminded of the days when we were stateless people living at the mercy of others, and by recognizing the way stateless statelessness threatens Palestinian dignity. We ensure that statehood doesn't rob us of our own, he writes. All right. Another young man in his 20s from Chicago echoes this insight. I live the mainstream Jewish American existence, liberal synagogue in Chicago. I learned that tzedakah is an important Jewish value. I understand my Jewish identity is shaped by the legacy of the Holocaust. This is the context within which I understand Jewish social justice work as an impetus to prevent genocide. Those values are inf influencing my activism now. I see strong connections between Palestinian diasporas and the pictures of the Jewish uh, shtetls. Strong connections. Weinert clearly identifies that, an, uh, that articulating positions on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict requires Jewish self-interrogation and reflexivity, even if he personally doesn't question Zionism as a political project. To this extent, his reflections illustrate re resonance with the Pew's finding concerning how, to recall, six, for 69% of American Jews, leading ethical and moral life is what is most essential about being Jewish, closely connected with remembering the Holocaust as embodying the, meanings, the meaning of Jewishness, the commitment to, to the ethical and moral life pushes American Jews to engage with the universal rather than particular lesson this Jewish of this Jewish tragedy. This is the faded yellow photograph of ourselves that Beinart, along with my respondent here, cannot see when they look at the practices of the Israeli nation state, which was supposedly established in order to eliminate the possibility of another Holocaust. While a causal reading, uh, a, a casual reading of the Pew survey shows that the majority of American Jews still feel emotionally attached to varying degrees to Israel, the deeper data that engage specifically with the question of the essential meanings of being Jew Jewish signal internal divergences and complexities with respect to the question of attachment and support of Israeli policies toward the Palestinians. The voices featured so far in my talk managed to undo the conflation of Zionism and Judaism, a process tra tra traversing through outrage and cognitive dissonance as a result of truly seeing the Palestinians. I ask how awakening to the sufferings of the other contributes to refiguring an understanding and practice of the Jewish tradition, and what broader questions about tradition and change can be discerned from this analysis. One activist, um, uh, act activist with rabbinical student uh, who also participated um, in the writing of the Ninth of Av liturgy for Jewish Voice for Peace just recently in 2014, uh, in the midst of the recent escalation in Gaza, told me, creating and adapting rituals is healing. The ritual involved a recitation of the names of Gazans murdered. From, from the reports of those who put the ritual into action, this movement um, of recitation was very, very powerful. The, uh, the moment of recitation. I will argue that the Jewish activists I inter uh, interview are in effect critical caretakers of Jewish tradition. 
They all acknowledge undergoing a journey where they needed to de-learn certain received axiom about Israel and how it related to their own self-understanding as Jewish, as Jewish persons. In fact, de-learning is the exact word or concept many of them would employ themselves to discuss their process of developing a critical stance with respect to Israeli policies and concurrently cultivating sentiments of solidarity with Palestinians. So uh, de-learning or denaturalizing what appears self-evident is what is meant by critique, by tracing the relations between power and knowledge, and in their case, becoming overwhelmed by the feeling of dissonance between their ethical self-perceptions and what the Israeli state is supposedly doing in their name. This process of coming to see the Palestinian predicament generates a feeling of outrage, as well as loss of previous axiomatic certainties. However, the experience of loss aided by de-learning is a necessary but insufficient factor in developing a constructive Jewish intervention. Therefore, beyond critique and dissonance, there is also a concurrent uh, a, a concurrent process of refiguring Jewish identity outside the deconstructed hegemonic logic previously in place. This process of refiguring is highly relational and historical. It involves reimagining the Jewish meanings of liturgy through the eyes of Palestinians. And it involves reconnecting to a Jewish tradition of social justice activism, deeply embedded within the prophetic motifs. In many respects, the critics are critics because they are caretakers reassessing what it means to be Jewish after comprehending what it has meant to be a Palestinian since at least the Balfour Declaration where a British Lord promised the establishment of a Jewish home on the land of Palestinians. This is what I mean by underscoring religious innovation as a multi-perspectival process of ethical reflection thoroughly embedded within a human rights frame. So the holiday of Sukkot of 2013 for instance, offered an occasion for protest and constructive reimagining of Jewish identity. Activists associated with Jewish Voice for Peace marked the holiday publicly by constructing a ritual Sukkot outside Israeli consulate in key American cities. The public Sukkot meant to protest the power plan that meant that, that intended to, um, to, to evacuate thousands, uh, tens of thousands of Bedouins from the south of Israel. So through evoking the meanings of the holiday and what it was de designed to, to commemorate, they engage in, in, in the protest of this, um, uh, of, of, of this plan to evacuate uh, the Bedouins. The protest ritual included a series of questions to be, to be discussed in the sukkah, privately and publicly. What does home mean to you? How does building and, and, uh, b building and being in a sukkah in a temporary structure help you relate to people whose housing is more precarious than yours. These two examples, uh, th these examples show that the questions are designed to highlight the universal humanistic meaning of the sukkah and generate a feeling of connection and solidarity with the testimonies of Bedouins who were about to be uprooted. The discussion follows with a prescription for a ritualistic shaking of the lulav and the etrog. The sukkot example shows that Jewish resources are employed to articulate a specifically Jewish critique and protest of Israeli policies. Jewish resources, however, are also used constructively through reinterpreting apparent axioms by way of retrieval of competing motives from the, from the vastness of tradition, and by ritually practicing according, accordingly revised liturgies. That these developments happen through the space of solidarity illuminates the degree to which the broader tradition of human rights could influence and revise religious practice, texts, and norms of engaging, in engagement. Notably, however, this process of revising or refiguring doesn't amount to a simple sub subordinating or diluting of tradition to a set of norms supposedly over and against it, but rather to an effort to reclaim alternative ways of being Jewish American. I use the hyphenated construct here to underscore that the question concerning the meanings of being Jewish must be asked contextually and require unpacking the sociocultural and other discourses employed in responding to it. I already highlighted above that the Jewish Palestine solidarity activists are first and foremost critical caretakers of an American Judaism, whether or not their in indebtedness to their American context and presuppositions are fully theorized. So, um, 
to go back to, um, to this, uh, situating my interviews with Jewish activists within a broader study of, uh, of diverse sample of non-Jewish Palestine solidarity actors of the secular and faith-based varieties, important common threads clearly emerge. All of the 100 interviewees employ the language of human rights and anti-colonial struggle in offering <coughs> their, uh, their own analysis <coughs> of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Many of them also discuss white privilege, as I mentioned, whether their own or as a social commentary, and the need to connect the dots among various sites of injustice from Islamophobia and militarism to anti-immigration policy, police brutality, and the legacy of settler colonialism and Euro-American involvement in the Middle East. Whether the Jewish respondent participated in the, in the context of secular organizations such as Students for Justice for Palestine or in specifically Jewish organizations such as Jewish, Jewish Voice for Peace, they arrived at their sense of outrage about Israeli policies and solidarity with Palestinians through a process of critiquing the dominant articulation of the relation between Jews and Israel. This critique is often the outcome of, of a substantive learning about Israel and Israeli history and its ramifications to Palestinians. It is also about reinterpreting Jewish identity. Therefore, Jewish Palestine solidarity work moves beyond the scope of non-Jewish Palestine solidarity activism. It is pivotally about internal Jewish contestation. What is done in my name and what should not be done in my name and why and how can we response, uh, 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 can my response be informed by my understanding of the Jewish tradition and my identity as a Jew. To engage critically with the, with the Jewish tradition entails a careful and multifaceted textual work pro processing, reinterpreting and retrieving some motifs while downplaying others. This process of critique also <clears throat> draws on historically situated, embedded, and embodied narratives. To innovate hermeneutically within the tradition, within a tradition, therefore, is a matter for both textual and contextual work. In other words, to argue Jewishly, one doesn't necessarily need to retrieve a particular midrash or a biblical passage. Jewish arguments can be articulated by way of retrieving Jewish historical experiences such as persecutions, wandering, and prophetic legacy of speaking truth to power. This inclination is already evident in the quote above from Beinart, who cited both the Midrash and the Jewish historical legacy of uprootedness and, and persecutions. This type of hermeneutical work is also echoed strongly in how the various Jewish activists I spoke to responded to my pondering about what it meant to them to be Jewish. For many of the already mentioned activists, uh, the Jewish history of displacement and genocide offers resources for and a sense of obligation to stand in solidarity with the Palestinian. <clears throat> uh, uh, w one activist who underwent at the time of the interview a two-year rabbinic training underscores her religious commitment and upbringing within the reconstructionist uh, current where ideas of chosenness and election were relinquished and yet a commitment to reconstruct the Jewish liturgy and text remains. I believe in the importance of seeing the world through a particular lens. I derive lots of meanings from living a Jewish time and Jewish calendar, she told me. Her solidarity work was explicitly formed through her passion for Jewish liturgy and her sense of, of a commitment to a particular ethical message she attributed to Judaism as well as a broader enculturation during college into queer trans activism. Now, the reference to prior politicization on questions of gender is not irrelevant and recurs in many of the, interview, the interviews I conducted. Another rabbinical student <clears throat> told me that feminism, feminist and other gender theorizing and critique offer important resources for refiguring how Jewishness related to the political project of Israel. <clears throat> now that I'm in a rabbinic school, she told me, I'm blessed to be in accord with feminists and queer people who are marginalized from the tradition and who are trying to figure out how to live within the tradition in integrity as feminist. Zionism, in some respects, is easier to deal with because it is so modern as opposed to the inherent patriarchy hardwired into Judaism. And yet another activist whose upbringing she describes as Jewish Buddhist and hardly Jewish in a religious sense of practice formed a small community of other Jewish students where they together learned about Jewish liturgy and worked to denationalize uh, to denationalize the liturgy. Political positions with respect to Israel-Palestine were not discussed in this forum, but rather assumed. The Jewish members of the community were all active in other campus 
wide Palestine solidarity activism, but needed to supplement this activism with a deep uh, process of Jewish learning. I introduce these examples here to show that Jewish Palestine activism doesn't only involve a simple overcoming of a dissonance between liberalism and Judaism qua Zionism, but rather a complex reworking of the meanings of Jewish identity with implications for ritual practice and liturgy. Limitations. At the same time, and to return to a point I anticipated, the intense solidarity with Palestinians, which generated the process of refiguring American Jewish identity, doesn't, uh, does so through devaluing Jewish Israeli collective claims and attachments and revalorizing the diasporic as most authentically Jewish. When responded to the question concerning their envisioning of an optimal solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, most interviewees underscored that it was for the Israelis and Palestinians to determine the shape and forms of however many nation states will end up there. No matter what, most of them continued, we are committed to the principle of equality and democracy. For all of the, um, so for all of the immense sophistication in which Jewish-Palestine solidarity operates, overlapping and occasionally certifying the broader Palestine solidarity movement, its vision of the co contours of an optimal peace employ, as I noted, thin secularism. This inclination is not distinct to Jewish-Palestine solidarity, but rather is a common, a common denominator across spheres of Palestine solidarity activism. And there is a general argument to be made here about solidarity activism. Uh, but for the purpose of the talk today, it is important to note that the thin and generic imagining of the future of Israel-Palestine is symptomatic of the degree to which solidarity with Palestinians offers a space and a context primarily for renegotiating Jewish, uh, Jewish American identity outside of Zionist teleology. Well, the stated goal of Jewish Voice for Peace, for instance, is, to, quote, to achieve a lasting peace that recognizes the rights of both Israelis and Palestinians for security and self-determination. It's theorizing power, power and Zion out of Jewish tradition, rendering them as perversion and subversion of Jewish universal values, diminishes the scope of religious innovation and the claim for participating in peace building. This tendency is also apparent on the level of scholarship where Judaism is framed as essentially anti-Constantinian and th therefore at odds with Zionist practices and ideological underpinnings. It is also framed as diasporic, therefore subverting the negation of exile motif threaded through Zionist narratives. It's a negation of a negation. Ultimately, disengaging from Zion offers a reactionary account to Zionism that doesn't properly theorize the role space Zion occupies in the Jewish imagination. The point here is not to diminish from the in innovative and crucial caretaking of Jewish Palestine solidarity activists. Instead, I suggest that the Israel-Palestine chapter in modern Jewish history doesn't only open the door to refigure tradition and ethos, uh, ethnos in America, but also to rethinking non-Messianic and non-hegemonic political path for Jewish life in Zion slash Israel. The Jewish resources, Jewish, vo uh, Jewish Voice for Peace deploys remains highly Ashkenazi, European. This is one area where expansion of the hermeneutical process to include Mizrahi or Arab Jewish resources can take place in a way applicable contextually to the Middle East. In addition, the reactionary valorization of the diasporic as most essentially Jewish operates with an idealized interpretation of the US or its stated principles, even if recognizing discrepancy between practices and principles, an idealization that doesn't allow engaging with the US own struggles with the intersections of religion, nationalism, ethnicity, and culture, a presumption of the possibility of state neutrality and its trans translatability or diffusion to other contexts appears to dominate the modes in which Palestine solidarity activists of all varieties, including Jewish, imagine an optimal solution. So in conclusion, Beinert's articulation of a growing in inevitability of the mostly younger Jewish generation to choose between a support of Israel and their otherwise progressivism and, Jewish, uh, and the Jewish philosopher Shaul Magid's analysis of post-ethnic 
American Judaism as emerging out of assimilation, intermarriages, syncretism, and expanding the community to non-Jews uh, to non-Jews, have in common recognizing the prioritizing of ethnicity as a central dimension of Judaism as deficient. A crucial question to ask, however, is whether the dislocation of ethnicity vis-a-vis -vis Jewish identity provides the deep background to the ethical outrage experienced by Jewish Palestine solidarity activists and whether the most constructive response to this outrage is to theorize ethnicity or peoplehood out of what it means to be Jewish. While Magid's analysis is inward looking in the sense that it attempts to explain transformations within American Judaism by looking at the particularities of American Jewish experiences, Jewish American Palestine solidarity activists reimagined the place of ethnicity and Jewish nationalism as a result of an ethical confrontation with the implications and realities of Zionism to its Palestinian victims. And therefore, their process of reimagining Judaism transverses through a place of solidarity with the other. It is, so it's outward looking. It is a multi-perspectival process of critique and change that takes them outside of their conventional understanding of who they were as Jews and forces them to think about alternative ways of being Jewish consistent with their otherwise sense of rootedness within an American progressive tradition of social justice. Outrage, cognitive dissonance, and imagining Jewishness in a post-ethnic, and post-Zionist fashion, however, illuminates the limits of Jewish-Palestine solidarity activism as a specifically Jewish intervention in peace building. So I'll end here. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, and you can either speak from your own perspective or from the perspective of the people whom you interviewed. Um, for me, it seems that there's a jump between disengaging from current Israeli policies and disengaging, so to speak, from Zion. Um, and like, I imagine a scenario in which um, disagreeing with Israeli government actions doesn't have to mean disengaging from uh, a Jewish identity that has national and ethnic components. Uh, and it makes me, it, in some ways, the insider nature provided when um, a nation, a national identity continues, that there's something strong in that, um, just as I can remain American and disagree with how my taxes are being spent. Um, so if you could speak to that. Yeah, um, an excellent question. Um, yeah, uh, of course there is a spectrum um, of, um, of voices of people I, I've spoken to. So th the particular people I've spoken to are uh, engaged actively um, in, pa I mean, I spoke to other, you know, <laughs> the, um, I locate them within a broader landscape, but uh, they're actively uh, working for Palestine solidarity. Uh, and that, um, that move um, uh, really um, uh, enable kind of this process of, of questioning. I mean, it's not um, uh, kind of a conventional critique of the settlement, uh, of the settlement, um, um, co settlement construction in the territories occupied in 67. It becomes a deeper, uh, a deeper engagement, but, 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 but you're correct that within that you, you still see a landscape of various levels of engagement with um, 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 what would be um, the correct way for Israel to be Jewish, uh, and what, what is the relevance of Israel um, uh, to, to their identity. But there is a growing, um, a growing distance, a growing disengagement, not only from, um, not only from the policies uh, related to um, uh, to the settlements, so presupposing the line of 67, not only as a spatial boundary, but also as a normative boundary. There is a broader kind of a deepening of, of, um, of the understanding of the relationship between 48 and 67 and beyond. Um, and, uh, but, but it's true that there are various ways in which um, the, um, uh, the understanding of Zion uh, relate to, to people's activism. But what I especially wanted to distill then how when you engage in active solidarity, and of course, what is solidarity is something that you can uh, problematize. And I always ask them, uh, the, 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 uh, the people I interview, what, uh, do, you, do you consider yourself a solidarity activist? And some, some of them would say, well, no, because if you are a solidarity activist, you take your directives from the oppressed, from the people who are, uh, and we don't take their, our directives from them. Um, uh, we, we engage mostly 
in a Jewish issue <laughs> um, uh, internally uh, that is relevant to, 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 to the oppressed, but, 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 but some of them are actually explicitly understand themselves as engaging in solidarity. And that reflects on, on their, in, uh, their understanding of their relationship with, with, with Israel, how Israel re related to their Jewish identity. Mm -hmm. Diana. I'm interested in asking about, uh, well, one of the parts of what this very, very rich talk, but you describe people who were both outraged, and that's such a good word, mm -hmm. with what they experienced and what they saw mm -hmm. in Israel and uh, Palestine. And then their outrage extends to the fact that they are silenced about it, mm -hmm. and that the silence that, uh, pervades many of these discussions in the United States is also an outrage. Mm -hmm. And as, uh, I, I'd like to hear a little more about that. You talk mm -hmm. about the mm -hmm. Open Hillel movement, yeah. mm -hmm. which is uh, very vibrant mm -hmm. uh, and relevant here. And it seems to me, you know, if we're thinking about religious resources for peace building, one of the real resources is dialogue. Yeah. And when dialogue is not permitted, mm -hmm. um, because you just can't talk to the people. You can't, you can't have a dialogue yeah. at Hillel about yeah. Yeah. certain kinds of yeah. things. Yeah, or, guidelines. you know, that's a, yeah. that's a, a broader issue mm -hmm. as well, where mm -hmm. um, I've had a lot of experience in sort of uh, basically advocacy groups in the United States, and certain of them, for example, the Anti-Defamation League, will not sit at the same table with the Council on American-Islamic Relations yeah. because they disagree. Of course, uh, you know, the, if you can't actually dialogue with the people you most disagree with, yeah. then we have a real problem. And I think that the silencing of difficult dialogues is, yeah. is one that I think uh, some of your interlocutors mm -hmm. and probably yeah. many other people feel is a real issue in the yeah. United States. Yeah, I mean, um, this is um, um, a, a, an, an extremely important uh, issue, the sense of that um, they, uh, w when they came with questions, for instance, w um, uh, I spoke f to a few people who actually went on the, um, uh, the uh, birthright trip. I mean, they, they, they were very much products of American Jewish education, uh, either in reform or conservative, and um, uh, they went on the birthright trip and, and, and read in the news that while they were there, there was a, a massacre going on in Gaza, and they asked questions, and those questions were not responded to. Uh, and then they return home and continue to ask questions, and those questions were not responded to. So, and so they are smart college children, uh, kids, uh, adults, <laughs> um, and um, uh, and they, they start reading, and, um, um, and 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 then they wanted to to bring people to speak in Hillel, and they were not able to. And and th th this is an, an outrage because they, there is a sense that there is um, many of them expressed a sense that there was no uh, leadership. Um, so the people they, they look up to as their leaders, leaders of the community, are not saying anything, or, or, or they're saying, or they are supporting um, uh, 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 practices that, that uh, are inconsistent with their understanding of what, what is just and, and so forth, so with the sense of dissonance. And, and um, uh, so, uh, so yeah, and this has become um, kind of, um, uh, this has become a major issue. Um, uh, all, all, all the people I interviewed who, are, who participate in Jewish-Palestine solidarity work um, of various levels um, uh, engage in this and are all, also experience a sense of loss within their own um, family. Um, and, um, uh, but, but there is also um, a sense of, uh, again, a community that is constructed with one another <laughs> um, where they, uh, they go through various... Uh, the, 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 uh, we learn Judaism or learn it for the first time from this particular perse perspective, always reading whatever text they are reading, they are reading it from the perspective of the oppressed, which they um, uh, relate to the, to the Palestinians. So yeah, there, I mean, um, I, I, the, many of them will be very, uh, are very open to engage the authorities, the establishment. I mean, they want to, they, they have a sense that they want to, that they want to remain Jewish, they don't want to let go of being Jewish. So they want to participate in this. So they would engage in dialogue, but uh, but I, I um, or, or a conversation. I mean, that's that's one of the issues where um, um, or one of the sides of struggles. I mean, uh, that, that is uh, closely related to the um, 
the, uh, the struggle against um, um, representation of the, Palis the Palis or lack of representation, accurate pre representation of the um, of Palestinian narratives. This is where they con they, they converge with the other uh, non-Jewish Palis Palestine solidarity activism. My question is about the definition of justice. My first intellectual experience was with, when I encountered Plato. Mm. And uh, Plato or Socrates say you cannot have a good intellectual discussion, any discussion, unless you define your terms. And I want to start from the dialogue, my question. Because uh, years ago I heard, I was in a seminar by, uh, at that time, very prominent, uh, psychologist, psychotherapist, uh, who had a discussion with Martin Buber. And Martin Buber uh, said that you cannot have real communication unless there's mutuality. And mutuality, in a way, symmetry, like the goddess of justice mm -hmm. keeping the scale, blinded, keeping the scales. Mm -hmm. and. I wanted to ask you more specifically about how do you, you gave us a very good presentation of the Jewish critics of Israel. And I wonder what can you tell us? And one of those critics was a lifelong friend of, uh, friend of mine, uh, Israel Shachak. And I, last time I saw him, I was worried about him ask him maybe somebody may try to assassinate him. And he said, Betoch ami ani yoshev. I am among my people. I am not afraid. Nobody tried to assassinate him. I was wondering, could you give us some survey of the other side? How much can you tell us about Arab or Muslim critics which are equally outspoken as the Jewish critics, which you gave us such a good report okay. about, because <laughs> without it, we have a one-sided picture. Okay. I, I, the, I met only one such critic, and this was at Harvard a few years ago, Hirsi Ali, you probably know the name. Okay. Hirsi yeah. Ali, yeah. whose partner in making a film, grandson of Theo okay. Van Gogh. I, so I think I understand the question. Um, yeah. and, and she and was I, yeah. accompanied, mm -hmm. I didn't finish my question, mm -hmm. accompanied by bodyguards, including from Harvard, including from, from mm. other police. You are not accompanied by bodyguards, I'm glad so. And I, I asked Israel Shachak, he's not afraid he'll be assassinated, he said, no. And I wonder, what yeah. can you tell us about the other side? Are they equal critics of the Arab position yeah. or Muslim position that you could tell us about? Okay, um, so um, I understand where the question is coming from, and I think it's very much related to the previous question about um, Symmetry. About silencing. Um, about silencing. I, mean, I think that, I mean, I would just say, I mean, I can go, go into a, a, a mapping the so-called other side. Um, I, wh what I can say is that part of the issue with respect to this particular conflict or topic is that um, uh, um, there is always uh, a demand as part of the, of the, um, the structure of silencing to have a balance uh, but that very dem th that demand itself is very biased. Is a very biased demand. Uh, when you talked about uh, so uh, um, so so that's part of uh, this is where your where your question is coming from, and it's not it's really not relevant to um, uh, to the articulation of of, um, of the of the topic of today, which is uh, a very specific. Justice is one of your major concepts here. Uh, yeah, well, the, yeah, the justice is with, uh, uh, with reference to this particular, uh, the complexities of this particular case um, and um, uh, from, from a particular perspective. And as I said, uh, uh, this particular uh, uh, group or, or slice of, a soli of solidarity activism intersects with the, those broader slices of activism that include, I mean, it's uh, internally diverse uh, and, and, and pluralistic with various agendas and, and, and ways of imagining justice, peace and justice, and, um, and, and the point is, uh, from the perspective of the, the voices that I presented today, is to recognize uh, as is really an outrage with respect to a fundamental um, uh, injustice, that they, that, that they see 
themselves implicated in and, uh, and how they deal with it. So I'll leave it at this. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'd like to point on two things. Maybe I could put a bit more into your, uh, your question, sir. I'm Palestinian, and I'm Palestinian who lives in Palestine. I happen to be at Harvard at this time. So maybe the other perspective is um, within the younger generation, there's a very much of a growing generation that's actually uh, questioning what's next. Is it about uh, two states? We don't believe in two states anymore. Is it about a one state? Uh, we know the Israeli side doesn't believe in a one state. So what's next? Uh, and that's rising and rising more and more. Uh, now, is there advocacy happening? There are lots and lots of um, uh, activities that are happening now whereby Palestinians are calling for Israelis to come and visit the Palestinian side uh, to, to hear about it. Because on the Palestinian side, we believe that we know more about the Israeli side than they know about us. Uh, so there are more and more of those activities. Even during the, the attacks on Gaza, there was still such activities happening. Uh, so where is the rise going? Um, uh, we're seeing the BDS, yes, growing in Palestine, but we're also seeing more people wanting to learn more about the other side and more people wanting to cooperate, yet within a basis of neutrality and equality. And, uh, uh, and I would say the same morals which come in every religion. Uh, so I hope I gave a bit of an answer to your question. The, the second question goes to you is, uh, in terms of the activists uh, with the solidarity movement, how much are they, because of the identity issue with, rela with relation to uh, Judaism, mm -hmm. uh, how much do they reflect if they did on the, uh, the issue of a Jewish state, mm -hmm. uh, not, not only Israel as, in, as a state yeah. today? Yeah, yeah well, um, yeah, this is, um, um, related to uh, the, the first question, uh, so um, many of them struggle with um, um, uh, with, uh, with the whole kind of the, the underpinning, the very conceptualization of um, of Israel as um, ethnocentric um, or ethnocracy. Uh, so this part, this is this informs a part of their process of, of critique and disengagement or reframing, refiguring their own relationship to it, but also. Um, a recognition that that very conceptualization um, of Israel um, uh, as um, uh, uh, the, 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 um, as ethnocentric uh, is um, is at the very heart. It's the root cause of the um, of the conflict. So this is what has to be challenged and transformed. And then they bring, and this is where my um, where I highlighted the limitations of their of their particular perspective as Jewish Americans. Um, uh, that then they retrieve this particular kind of abstracted understanding of well, what 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 would be a just uh, reconfiguration of Israel and Palestine, and they and they take those abstract abstracted principles of um, equality. Um, equality, justice, um, dignity, uh, um, uh, religious freedoms, um, all those uh, great goods. Um, but, 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 but what, what, so, so my, the, my point about limitation is that there are a whole lot of actual on the ground constructive work that involves um, uh, articulating and rethinking, reimagining how um, cultural, religious, uh, ethnic sources can relate to one another. This, this this kind of work will have to take place. It's not by. It's not that you can say, okay, I recognize that one idea didn't work, so here's another idea. Because you have soci sociological and anthropological realities that are there. So how do you are going to reframe it? So I think that what you said about, I mean, I th uh, the, the places where peace building can really happen is on the ground with the actual people, uh, and part of what has to happen is this, um, th that process of. Um, uh, uh, deflating some of the um, uh, symbolic dynamics um, added interest that relate to this particular conflict. But of course then you have, um, you have to work around the issue of normalization uh, that is um, uh, because uh, there has been so much, I mean now decades of industry of peace building um, on the ground. So many people are doing interfaith work, so many people are doing all kind of bringing 
Palestinian kids and, and Israeli Jewish kids together. Um, and and th this part of industry, the peace building industry, is it's so entrenched and, or, or normalizes the occupation. So there is a lot of resistance to, to dialogue. <laughs> So, so I'm curious to maybe to shift uh, to a different part of your talk is this idea of hermeneutical innovation within within Judaism. And it struck me that a lot of what you're saying about trying to um, play up certain strands of the tradition and preserve it as the tradition, but also acknowledge new realities and so on, echoes a, a, a prominent theme across, you might say, modern Jewish thought or even modern religious thought more broadly. So I was wondering about the self-consciousness of, of these actors as innovators? I mean, is it more sort of your own reading of what they're doing, or how much are they aware that this is a, a you know, I think in Moses Mendelssohn with Jerusalem yeah. in, in modern Jewish thought, how much do they see themselves as part of that kind of intellectual tradition or not? Oh yeah, uh, excellent question. I mean, they very, uh, they, they assume that this role very explicitly. I mean, they sit together and think of, they read um, uh, the um, liturgy, and they look at how the liturgy itself was nationalized. Um, and, and they are working systematically through it, trying to denationalize it, uh, reclaim it, reread it uh, through, uh, uh, kind of relationally. So really be confronted by, okay, so you read, um, um, so you, you, you go through the Seder, the Passover Seder, and how can you, uh, how can you tell the story today? Uh, so, so very explicitly, they, they assume this role there because they want to be Jewish. <laughs> I mean, this, this has been a kind of a common thread um, in what I heard. And, and you, you hear it in various levels. I mean, you talk to uh, students who are rabbinical, uh, 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 interviewees who are rabbinical students, so this is very explicit. But then you have various levels of this um, attempt to, to reclaim or innovate uh, and being conscious of this um, uh, by, by people who, who, who define themselves as um, spiritual and you know, use all those other uh, kind of broader categories that are used elsewhere in the US, like then we are nuns, but we are Jewish. But, um, so, uh, but, but, but then there is a process of reclaiming, and, and often there is a, a real tension with their immediate circle, with the family, with parents, sisters, brothers, and um, so, so it has to be a conscious, of, and, and, and they articulate their, uh, their critique uh, in a highly sophisticated way because it involves so much learning and reading and, and rethinking. Yeah. One more, one more question. question. Yeah. I'm a novice to the way in the Middle East. Um, but as I'm listening, I'm wondering if, <clears throat> if, um, if, if the land of Israel is no, is no longer ethnocentric or does no, is no longer a Jewish state, is it necessarily true that it no longer can serve as a refuge for against an anti-Semitism or the recurrence of a Holocaust, as you mentioned earlier? Does that reason for being no longer possible? And does the world deserve a place? Uh, does, is there, should there be a place in the world for that? Yeah. Um, well, many, uh, many of the, the, the people I talk to, uh, I ask them explicitly about anti-Semitism we, uh, the real anti-Semitism, not the kind of the McCarthyan type of ac being uh, um, of uh, the accusation of anti-Semitism or self-hating with reference to to critique, uh, and they all recognize that that it's um, uh, that there is <laughs> real anti-Semitism and that Israel is not helping it, and Israeli policies are not helping it. Uh, it, do it doesn't change the, 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 their broader analysis, uh, um, uh, and um, and um, yeah, I mean you. Um, it's, um, um, uh, f from my position, my understanding, very much in line echoing what, um, um, what is your name? Yeah. Uh, said, um, on the ground you have to rework, I mean, it, uh, to, to reframe the, uh, the, the meaning of citizenship and belonging in what, whatever it's going to be called, Israel, Palestine, Israel, Palestine, whatever it's going to be, to be named, it, it doesn't, it's not an either or game. I mean, you can still be uh, Jewish and Israeli without being hegemonic. Um, and um, uh, but, but those identities need to, to work out in various levels, um, and um, so um, and uh, so so this will be part of the issue. Uh, uh, some of the issues that will have to be worked out, and it's it's correct that you cannot dismiss anti-Semitism. Uh, it's definitely part of the analysis. Thank you. <laughs>